Welcome and good morning. My name is Steven Strauss and I'll be your host for this webinar. This is Correlated Magnetics Research's webinar entitled Smart Magnets for Smart Product Design. At this time, I will start the webinar. Today's presenter will be Jason Morgan and he is Vice President of Engineering for Correlated Magnetics Research. Thank you, Stephen. As Stephen said, I'm Jason Morgan. I'm the Vice President of Engineering for Correlated Magnetics Research. And we'll give you an introduction to designing products using polymagnets. On the agenda today is a brief overview of our company so that you'll know a little bit more about who we are. And then we will discuss using magnets in product design and some of the limitations that you run into with the magnets that are out there today. And we'll tell you what we're doing to try to help that. Then we'll take a simple product concept and take it through several requirements and problems that might come up and talk about how we can address those with our magnets. And of course, we'll leave time for some questions at the end. Correlated Magnetics Research was founded in 2008. We've had significant technology developments in that time, and the technology continues to grow. Perhaps more significantly to you is the growth in our ability to design, integrate, and deliver solutions for products like yours. When we say smart magnet system design, we mean that we have a core set of scalable solutions in our catalog that allow us to respond to a variety of product needs. And we have a talented team of engineers to help you bring your product designs to market. Ultimately, we deliver the magnets that make your product possible. Our factory is shipping magnets in volume to make sure the solutions you develop can be delivered to your customers. Now let's get into the magnets. Magnets are amazing, but they're not perfect. There's a lot of common problems in product design using magnets. They're not as strong as expected much of the time. A lot of the available data is based on unrealistic test cases that don't apply to your product. Magnets can slam together from a distance. Magnets tend to pick up stray objects. Magnets can damage credit cards and interfere with sensitive devices. By themselves, they don't provide a lot of shear force resistance and they don't really align very well. Take, for example, the test data that is out there for magnets that you might use in your design. Um, a lot of the data that's there is case one test data, which is a measure of a magnet against thick, heavy steel. It's a good measure of the energy that's in the magnet, but not a good indicator of the performance that you're going to get out of the magnet in your product design. Case two data is out there as well. Uh, it's, a, it's a measure of the magnet strength between two thick plates of metal, uh, which tends to increase the force of thin magnet. Again, it's not very practical for a lot of the products you're trying to design. But what if there was a smarter magnet? What if you could get the holding force you need, but eliminate the problems associated with magnets in product design? With, mag with magnets much the same as the ones we described just a moment ago, we can create an engineered system that behaves the way you want it to, and it feels great. We control the magnetic field to give the performance and functions that set your product apart. We make the product safe around credit cards and compatible with sensitive devices. We have man magnets that demonstrate great shear force and alignment features, and we provide reliable data so that, so that you can make sure you're getting what you need in your product. CMR's polymagnets are the answer to a lot of design problems. Let's take a simple design example and look at some of the questions that may come up during the design. Say we want to get a stronger magnet in a limited volume. So we want to get a more, sec more secure, controlled feel as the system comes together. How do you get more force while limiting the magnetic field so that you can maintain compatibility with credit cards and compasses? Uh, how can you make the product stay together better and improve the shear strength? And while we're improving the way it sticks together, let's improve the way it comes together. How can we create of system that self-aligns as you bring the two components together. For our example product, let's, com let's consider a tablet stand. Let's say we have a tablet a case that we want to stick to a, a stand to hold our tablet up next to our computer, make it convenient, maybe incorporate some charging or uh, other features into it. We want to use magnets to hold our case to our stand to make it easy to remove and attach. So we have a design concept that we're trying to, to work within. We, could, uh, we want to keep our design sleek, we want to keep everything thin uh, and light 
and as inexpensive as possible. So we could try a magnet in the base and a steel target in the case. That would let us keep the, the case thin and inexpensive and we don't have a lot but we don't have a lot of space for our magnets. It's always a compromise. So with our magnet in the base and our steel in the case we might find our initial results disappointing. Remember the, the case 2 test before. There's a lot of energy in a conventional magnet that is typically wasted in product design. Take a look at the graphic on the left showing the magnetic field lines and you'll see that much of the energy is lost through our thin steel target. Polymagnets are different. Instead of a north pole on one face and a south pole on the other with long field lines between the two faces, we create a network of pole regions on the face of the magnet. This gives us a tightly controlled magnetic circuit. It's much more efficient than a typical magnet and it works much better in our product. Check out the force curve on the right. This shows a comparison of the force of polymagnets to a conventional magnet. See the red arrow. It shows the, the difference in the force at a particular design gap or distance between the magnet and the target. You can see that we can get a good bit more force from a polymagnet than we can in a conventional magnet. There's several things that, that affect this gain in strength that we can get from a polymagnet. One is the target type and the thickness of the target. The, uh, the design distance is very important, the gap between the magnet and the target. The surface area of the magnet is what scales the force and it's very important. It's always at a premium. The surface area is always at a premium in product design, but it's a key factor in scaling our force. And magnet thickness comes into play, but not as much as you might expect. We'll talk more about that later. There's another benefit to incorporating a polymagnet into your design that we can see by looking at the force curve. It can make a significant difference in the way your system feels to the user. Magnets can cause components to accelerate from a distance, and this may not be the user experience that you want. Let's look at another force curve to see what I'm talking about. This is another graph comparing polymagnet forces to a conventional magnet. If you look at the blue box, it will show you where the, the conventional magnet has a stronger field out beyond where we're trying to hold our product together. That magnetic field is going to cause acceleration that's going to pull our product together. With a polymagnet though, we can control that field. We can focus the force where you want it so that your product comes together and holds securely without snapping together abruptly. Note that there are three polymagnet curves on this graph. The engagement range is tunable based on a number of factors to let you get the user experience you want. A steeper force curve is going to give you a shorter engagement distance, making your product feel secure as it is attached and easier to reposition. A more gradual force curve can be used to help pull the, pull the product together from a longer distance, but still in a controlled way. So we've chosen a polymagnet that gives us more force and gives us a more efficient circuit. But let's say we need to get even more force. Now one of our product requirements may be that we have to have compatibility with credit cards, that we can't damage a credit card. So we know from our testing that if we expose a credit card to 2,000 Gauss, we can corrupt the magnetic strip information on the credit card. So we want to keep our magnetic field low, but increase our holding force. So let's look at the options for increasing the force. Now one of the first things you might think of is to increase the grade of the magnet. But this increases the magnetic field flux and uh, raises the potential for damaging the credit card. We can also increase the thickness. A lot of times in product design this is actually um, a fairly easy knob to turn. But this also increases the magnetic field flux and as we showed earlier it may not be very efficient in our design. With polymagnets, we know, the, we know the way the magnetic field degrades as you move away from the magnet. So we can, we can control the, the magnetic field at a distance from the magnet. Uh, so the way we increase force with polymagnets is to increase the area, keep the grade and the thickness the same. A surface area is often at a premium in product design. So this is not going to be the first choice most of the time. But once you're at the limit of the 2,000 Gauss, 
It's really the best way to increase the force. You scale the force by increasing the area of the poly magnet. Keeping the other factors the same, you get the force that you want and maintain your compatibility with credit cards. So let's look at shear resistance in our product. We don't want our case to slide down on our stand. We want it to stay where we put it. And what we find is even though we have our, our poly magnet now that's providing a good holding force, um, we're really limited in the shear resistance that we have. The shear resistance comes from the, the holding force of the magnet against the steel target and the coefficient of friction between the two surfaces. Now this is one of the areas where a magnet to magnet polymagnet system can really can really come through and help our system. So let's compare three possible solutions to get more uh, shear resistance in our system. Um, we've talked about the polymagnet against the steel that we have and it's a good system. You have a good strong holding force and then you've got the friction of the uh, of the bodies that are being held together. Um, but if that's not enough then what else can we do? So let's take a look at a couple of magnet to magnet systems that will actually introduce a, a magnetic shear force component to our system. So on the bottom right you see a magnet to magnet system. Now these are conventional magnets and if you look over on the graph you can see that it does have a shear force component. It's a relatively small one and it's relatively long. As the, uh, the magnets di are displaced you get a fairly constant force that tries to pull them back to the equilibrium. Now up in the top right you see a magnet to magnet polymagnet system. And here you have a lot, of face uh, a lot of alternating poles facing each other and this creates a very nice shear resistance because of the attraction and repulsion between those alternating poles. Now take a look at the green curve in the graph. Note that as you get some displacement between the magnets, uh, some lateral displacement between the magnets, you actually get a, a fairly high a shear force back toward the equilibrium point. This gives you much better shear resistance than the other two systems. So we're almost done with our with our product design. We've got a product that, that comes together, feels good when it comes together, and holds securely. Um, but there's something missing. We want it to go together the same way every time, and it really doesn't. The user can put it wherever they want. It stays nicely, and maybe maybe that's okay. But maybe we have a charging feature or some other connection feature, or we just want the product to come together in the same way every time. And there is a family of polymagnets that answers that design requirement as well. If you've followed correlated magnetics over its history, you know that one of the things that, that we've done for a long time is self-aligning magnets. Um, these borrow from uh, coding theory in communications. And um, what these do, what these magnets do, is reject misalignment so that they basically only go together one way. Um, I'll show you how it works. If you take a look at the graph, you can see the blue line is the holding force between a pair of polymagnets. And the red line is the, the shear force or the alignment force between those polymagnets. And both of these are a function of displacement, lateral displacement. Note that as you, as you move away from center, as you move away from alignment, um, you get the force back toward alignment like we saw with the previous magnets. Um, but an interesting thing happens when you look at the, the force curve between the magnets. So you get um, a little bit of displacement between the magnets, you see that you'll go from a, a positive force that holds them together to a negative force. Uh, the green box on the graph shows there's actually a large area where the, the magnets are mostly repelling each other. Now, the great thing about that is it can make the components of your system seem to float uh, uh, away from each other until they're aligned, in which case they, uh, they click into place. So that's enough about our example product. What's really important is your product. So how do we go about designing your smart magnet system? We focus on the first, on the key requirements first. What force is needed? What kind of practical design gap do you have? What size limits do you have for the magnets? 
Then there's feel. How do we want the product to feel as it comes together? Which really translates to us to the engagement distance of the magnets. Next, we're going to consider the other functions that you want. Do you want uh, a shear resistance? Do you need alignment features? Maybe you need a release behavior in the, in the system so that uh, it's held together very strongly, but it's easy to get the, the products apart. Um, we need to consider all of those functions as we're designing your system. And as we go through your design, we need to keep the compatibility requirements in mind. With these requirements in mind, we can find a catalog magnet or we can engage in a custom design that will meet your requirements. Now whenever you bring a new technology into your product design, you're always going to have questions. So let's talk about some of the questions that might come up as you're considering polymagnets for your, for your design. So one of the first questions we get is, are these magnets permanent? And they are. We use neodymium magnets as our substrate, and polymagnets have the same durability as those neodymium magnets. Uh, they can be damaged. Uh, the enemy of magnets is heat. Exposing neodymium magnets to high levels of heat will cause it to lose some of its magnetic strength. And if you expose it to high enough heat, it will lose all of its magnetic strength. Um, we can address that for most applications by choosing the appropriate temperature grade for the neodymium. Of course, the magnets are created using a very high magnetic field. And if you expose the magnets to a very high magnetic field, it will change the, the behavior of the magnet. But with the high coercivity of neodymium, you're talking about um, magnetic fields in excess of 20,000 gauss to cause that kind of damage. So not something you're going to have to worry about in most applications. Another question is what sizes are available? In particular, how small can we get a polymagnet? And that depends on several factors, including the force and the design gap that we talked about earlier, and um, also any functions that you want to uh, want to use in your design. But we are able to make a simple polymagnet as small as about 12 millimeters by 3 millimeters. As far as dimensional tolerances, our standard tolerance for a polymagnet is plus or minus five thousandths of an inch or plus or minus 0.13 millimeters. We are able to hold tighter tolerances if necessary for your application. With any neodymium magnets, there's some variation on the force over manufacturing tolerances and that's going to be about plus or minus 5% for most polymagnets. When you get into functions like alignment, you're going to have questions about the precision of the magnets. And the repeatability for the magnetic regions on a polymagnet is plus or minus 0.25 millimeters. Our last frequently asked question for today is should I use a steel target or another polymagnet as a target? Using a steel target is typically less expensive and it may let you make your target thinner than you could if you were using a polymagnet to polymagnet system. But steel targets are a little bit limited in the amount of gap that they can handle and provide the, uh, the force that you want. And they're also limited as far as their functionality. Um, if you want alignment features or release behavior, um, or if you want to get the maximum shear force, you're going to want to use a polymagnet. And like I said, if you want to get the most distance possible, then you're going to want to use a polymagnet to polymagnet system. So you've heard me mention our polymagnet catalog. The catalog is a growing collection of useful magnets that can help you start your product design or just try out these unique magnets. You can learn more about the applications we support and which magnets make them possible. You can also get useful data to help you choose the right polymagnet for your product. You can learn more about some of the specialty functions we support like springs and latches and there are links to our partners so that you can purchase these magnets. We'll be adding more magnets and more selection tools frequently so please check our website often for these updates. And finally I'll leave you with one more thing. When you're ready for more um, feel free to contact one of our technical sales reps. They do a great job of helping you get started whether you need a catalog magnet or you need help from our magnetics engineering team. And that's it for now. Thank you for your attention, and I'll turn this back over to Stephen. Okay, thank you, Jason. We're now going to go into questions and answers. If you have any questions for Jason about any of the material presented today, or polymagnets in general, please submit your questions via the questions uh, panel on the webinar control panel.
Okay, I have a question here. The first one is, is there any limit to the size of the magnet? Jason? Uh, yes, from a practical standpoint, um, there, is a, there is an upper limit um, and there is a, a lower limit. Uh, let's, go, let's talk about the upper limit first. Um, we have printed magnets uh, up to you know, five inches in diameter. Uh, but that's you know, that's a pretty big magnet. Uh, we don't uh, we can actually go larger than that um, if we need to. So I think for most practical purposes, um, you know, there is a limit, but it's quite high, and we should we should be able to handle um, you know most applications. Um, now that's talking about the area, Stephen. Um, when you talk about the thickness, uh, we're most effective up to about uh, you know about half an inch or 13 millimeters. Um, we get a, above that thickness. Um, we are, you know, our polymagnets don't, um, we don't get the full benefit of our polymagnet technology. Uh, now, down at the lower limit, I, as I mentioned earlier, um, we can go, you know, we can get a useful uh, a attachment polymagnet and with even some uh, shear resistance in about a 12 millimeter long magnet. Uh, if we go much shorter than that, uh, unless it's a very short distance, a very short design gap that I talk, talked about. We're not going to get a lot of gain out of that magnet. So that's kind of the the upper limit and the lower limit. Jason, the next question is, uh, are there any current prototyping services? The person asks, are there lead times and minimum costs? Um, OK. The, um, uh, there are prototyping services, uh, as, I, as I mentioned. We, um, you know, we engage via our, our sales reps. So if you contact one of our uh, representative firms. Uh, you know, they'll they'll help you understand whether you need a, a catalog magnet that we already have and is available just to, to buy, or whether you need we need to engage our magnetics team. If we do engage our magnetics team, we'll go through uh, design analysis and um, uh, and the, the design requirements and come up with the best possible solution. Uh, there is a lead time on that. You know, it takes some time to design. Uh, usually, uh, we can get through a first iteration of that in, uh, you know, in less than two weeks. And then there is a lead time on getting prototype magnets. Uh, we're actually fairly quick on that. Uh, for a new engagement, um, it's about two. It's two weeks to get the magnets, and then a week for us to do our uh, final processing and, and testing. So. Uh, so three weeks uh, in order to turn around prototypes. Um, and as far as a, a minimum quantity, uh, you know, we would we take every opportunity as a as a unique um, chance to to engage in that design. And so we would take that on a one by one basis as to what the you know what the requirements would be, um, you know, pricing and so forth. So we would we would handle that on an individual case basis. What is the distance limitation between the two sets of polymagnets? Well, that um, that's a great question, and that depends on the um, the size of the polymagnets. Which, with larger magnets and in a magnet-to-magnet -magnet system, um, we're going to uh, we're going to get an effective range of um, you know five millimeters or more. Um, and I talk about the effective range. I, I really define that as where is a polymagnet stronger than a conventional magnet. Now that's not always the most important thing. Um, it may be that the alignment feature or the, um, uh, the the shear resistance is actually more important than the than the pure uh, holding strength. Um, but you know most of our uh, most of our design gaps that we work with uh, are on the order of um, you know, uh, 0.7 up to three millimeters. Um, we do uh, look at the the magnetic field and the and the um, the strength uh, specifically for those alignment features uh, out to you know five, six, seven millimeters. But um, uh, in general, the engagement distance for where the, the magnets are actually latched together is a little small, a little smaller than that um, between 0.7 and uh, and three millimeters. Okay, we have uh, another question about uh, getting project development help, um, and this person asks about the Central Coast of California, um, but the answer is to look on our uh, website under our contacts page uh, for, uh, 
for all the contact information for us and our, um, our field engineers. So Jason, the next question is, uh, can you explain what you mean by release behavior? Oh, yes, that's a, that's a great question. So when we talk about uh, the, the um, shear resistance and the um, alignment functions, um, as, you, as you saw in the graph, that when you shift those magnets laterally, you will actually get a, you'll go from a, a, a strong attraction to a, a repel or a relaxed position. And so with the release behavior, what we do is we shift a magnet laterally or we rotate a magnet and get uh, and go from an attached position, uh, you know, strong force holding them together to a, a force repelling uh, the, the components. Um, and so you can actually make a, a push button release or a twist release uh, feature in your product. And um, so that's what we were talking about there. Okay, Jason, a related question is, can I control the engage slash disengage uh, behavior with an external energized coil? In other words, an electromagnet. Right. Um, that is certainly possible. I mean, you can, and we've, we've done some experimentation with that. We don't have a, a product in development like that. Uh, but basically what you're doing is you're, you know, the, the magnetic fields um, are subject to superposition. So if you, um, if you have a certain magnetic behavior and then you add to it a, um, another um, magnetic field, then you can uh, certainly change that behavior. So it's definitely a possibility. Um, we are not, uh, we're not experts in designing electromagnets, um, and our magnets are, you know, they're patterned, so they have alternating faces of, uh, uh, not alternating, but they've got a pattern of uh, north and south regions. And um, so it would be a, it'd be a fairly complicated design, but it's uh, certainly something that, um, you know, uh, could be taken on, and uh, you certainly could achieve that. So, Jason, I'm going to go to the uh, the next question as we continue. And the next question is, what is the largest width? Okay, the the largest width of a magnet. Uh, you know, we can our uh, capacity um, is uh, is uh, approximately. Um, 10 inches by 10 inches. So uh, we have a good bit of we have a good bit of width to work with. Um, I mentioned you know uh, rectangular magnets in the in the webinar, but um, we can handle uh, you know round magnets. We can handle square magnets, and there's not really a limitation in in width um, compared to length, uh, other than the you know the the practical limits of our machine uh, that we use to to uh, Magnetize the material. Uh, so, from a from a practical standpoint, uh, you know, like I said earlier, we've we've handled magnets up to about five inches in diameter. Uh, we've not done any that are larger than that, even though we have a machine that's capable of it. Um, that that's really the largest magnet that uh, uh, that that our customers have wanted to handle. When the magnets get large like that, um, they are. Uh, you know, um, Harder to handle. Now, once you when you have a polymagnet, um, it makes it easier to handle because you have a much shorter field, so you don't have the acceleration from a distance. Um, but uh, but that's been our uh, that's been the limit of our experience is about uh, five inches in diameter. Uh, Jason, uh, we have a, a question about um, field control, and it says you mentioned these are safe for sensitive electronics. Do you have any experience around medical electronics such as pacemakers? Um, we, we do not, well, uh, we don't specifically have any, um, uh, experience around pacemakers. Uh, what we can do is, uh, you know, provide simulations and, um, and scans of physical magnets to, to tell you what the, uh, what the magnetic field does over distance, uh, as you, you know, as you, um, uh, get a distance away from these magnets. So we can provide a lot of data about what the magnets do over you know, uh, in space, um, but we can't offer advice on, you know, what a safe level would be for a pacemaker. Okay, thanks, Jason. Um, next question is about manufacturing. Um, 
where are your manufacturing facilities? Is any production of polymagnets done overseas? Uh, yes, there is there is um, polymagnet production done overseas, uh, specifically in China. Uh, a lot of the magnet supply chain is is centered in China uh, because there's uh, uh, the the source of the magnetic material. Um, there's the, uh, the the processors of the magnetic material, and then a lot of the first line consumers of the magnetic material. So uh, so yes, we uh, uh, we offer production in China, uh, and um, you yeah, know that's been uh, that's been successful for us. Okay, uh, next question. Um, <clears throat> we need to embed the magnets in rubber. Any comments on uh, rubber coatings of polymagnets? Um, sure. The, the the first thing that comes to mind when you talk about uh, embedding a magnet in rubber is that the rubber it tends to be about a millimeter thick, and so uh, when you when you do that, um, you know you're going to get some. You're going to basically that's going to be the closest distance you can be to the polymagnet. Um, we have uh, we've had some customers inquire about this, but we have not actually taken one all the way through this process. But uh, I don't see that, I don't see that it would be any any problem. Um, when you talk about uh, encasing the, the a polymagnet in um, in plastic or in you know, using a, a thermally set um, adhesive process that, you know, the thing that you worry about is the heat. Um, but with, uh, you know, with some of the rubber coatings that are out there, you would, you would not have to worry about that. Okay. Um, next question is, do polymagnets require special fixturing to control the movement relative to each other? Oh, that's a great question. And, um, and it really, it really depends on the application. And so, I'm just going to take a couple of minutes and talk about that. Um, we have uh, we have some unique functions like um, you know, springs and and um, uh, latches and you know some of the twist release uh, products that I talked about earlier. And those have to be uh, <coughs> excuse me those have to be actually constrained. We have other um, and so basically um, if you have magnets that are repelling, they are going to, to try to seek a solution of, of attraction. And so um, you have to actually constrain them to keep them to keep them centered uh, one above the other in order to get the behavior that you want. Um, there's other things that, that work better with with the constraint, you know, some of the some of the alignment functions and so forth. Um, but we also have a lot of magnets that that don't need that kind of constraint. Um, the alignment magnets that I talked about in the webinar as the, the last stage of our product uh, development um, don't require a, a um, constraint in order to work very well. And they, you, can, uh, you can make a product come together and feel really good coming together without having any kind of uh, specific constraint. So, so it does really depend on the behavior that you're looking for. Um, Certainly, the attachment magnets do not need that. It's typically the magnets that have some kind of a repel component that would need uh, would need some kind of balance or or constraint. Okay, uh, Jason. The next one is: What is the maximum shear force per unit on thin steel? So on on thin steel, what you the, the primary component of the shear force is. Um, uh, is the frictional force. Um, so it's really the, the attachment force um, times the coefficient of friction. So, um, you know, when we talk about the, uh, the force that we can get out of a, say, um, um, you know, a one inch square magnet, uh, we can get, um, you know, well over uh, 40 pounds out of, out of a magnet like that um, on a, um, you know, on a direct attachment to steel. So you can get a lot of you can get a lot of force, but you're not going to have a, a magnetic shear component um, in general when you're talking about um, attaching to steel, and to, unless you go across an interface where you have a you know um, uh, like a slot in the steel or you reach the edge of the steel, uh, you're not going to have a, a strong magnetic component to the uh, uh, to the shear. Okay, great. Next question is. Are your magnets shipped directly from China, 
in our case, we would use our polymagnets in Brazil. How could this be worked out? Uh, yes, we do. We can ship directly from China, and um, uh, I'm we we're able to uh, to export from from China. And um, off the top of my head, I don't know of a problem with shipping to Brazil, uh, and it's certainly something that um, you know that we can look at what the what the details would be. Uh, we we have not shipped into Brazil, but um, you know I would think that I would think that we can make that work. Okay, great. I'm going to combine two questions on this one, uh, Jason. So <clears throat> the first one is, can your magnets be shaped in different formats, different than round, say rectangular? And then is it possible to um, magnetize and uh, uh, get polymagnets in arc magnets? Um, okay, so first off, absolutely, we can, we can um, create different shapes and sizes. Um, you know, we we tend to talk in general in the in the catalog about round magnets and rectangular magnets and square magnets because they are, you know, they're common shapes and they're they're easy to, um, you know, easy to use and easy to demonstrate a lot of the functions with. Um, the uh, but we have done uh, arc shaped magnets, um, we've done disc magnets, we've done you know kind of um, uh, we've even done triangular magnets and magnets that are triangular in in section. Um, uh, what we do require is a flat surface. Uh, we we need the the magnet to be oriented such that we have a uh, a flat surface to magnetize. Um, we don't magnetize uh, around a, a curved surface. We can't. We don't magnetize from the inside of a surface. So, um, but arc segments um, we we have done and uh, we certainly can do. Okay, um, next one is, uh, are there any uh, polymagnets or experiments uh, done on electromotive force applications? Permanent magnet motors is the, uh, is the clarification. Um, yes, uh, it's, it's, been, it's really been limited so far to, um, to brushless DC motors. We've done a little bit of work with that. Um, it's, it has not, it's not yet a... Um, you know, a, a mainstream application for us, or a focus application for us. But uh, uh, what we do have to offer there is um, we have a lot of flexibility in the way we make rotors. So if someone wants a, a rotor with um, you know a specific shape between the the pole regions, uh, you know, a particular way they want the transition done, or a particular way that they uh, you know, um, let's just say they want some kind of uh, uh, modulation in the in the size of the uh, of the pole regions or something like that. Uh, we can certainly do that, and it's it's actually pretty it's actually pretty convenient uh, for us to to change those shapes, um, you know, and, and iterate through a design like that. So um, so yes, there's been there's been some work, uh, a little bit of experimentation by some of our uh, by some of our customers, uh, but that's you know, we don't we don't offer. Um, you know, expertise at this point in how to design your rotor, we offer expertise at this point in how to make your, your rotor a reality. The next question is, do you make magnets from samarium cobalt or other materials capable of withstanding 200 degrees C? Um, yes, we, we, have, we have made magnets with samarium cobalt, uh, and we, um, we would certainly be able to to engage that, and if you're talking about exceeding 200 degrees C, that's absolutely the recommendation. Um, so, um, so yeah, we would we would be very pleased to um, uh, to talk about how we can meet those needs. Uh, do you need a license to use correlated magnetics, or is it just a product purchase? It, it's a product purchase. Um, you know, when when you buy buy our magnets, um, you are uh, you know getting you are able to use those magnets in your product. So we're not, you know, it's not our business to to, to license IP. Um, it's, it's our business to um, uh, to make magnets available to you that incorporate our IP. So uh, hopefully that answers the question. You know, we're, we're not, uh, if, if you were to, to buy alignment magnets from us, it, you, would, uh, you would not have a, a separate um, you know, IP bill. Uh, you would have, um, you know, you would 
uh, buy the magnets from us and, and have the ability to use them in your product. But I interpret this question, Jason, as um, can you make uh, poly magnets with uh, complex features and functions, various uh, designs built into them, or various functions built into them? Okay. Uh, the answer to that is yes, and uh, I can give you a couple of uh, give you a couple of examples of that. Um, you know, we are able to uh, uh, to create magnets that uh, that repel at at one distance uh, and attract at another distance. It's the way we make our springs, and it's the way we make our our push to close latches. Um, we can also create magnets that have uh, you know they have different functions. Uh, depending on how um, uh, how they're oriented with respect to each other, um, we also uh, we can also engineer force curves uh, by pay, taking different features um, and uh, or different um, patterns and putting them together, and the superposition of the um, uh, of the force vectors actually can can allow us to engineer the uh, the force curve quite nicely. Um, so yes, we do have the ability to to layer on uh, uh, features to some extent, and um, you know the, some of the magnets are are quite complex. So um, so sure, we'd be happy to. That sounds like a question we should explore more. So um, you know it would be great to uh, to either get a follow up on that uh, or a follow up on the webinar or a um, you know a, a contact to to uh, some of the reps that were listed and and let's make sure that we answer the question properly. So the next question is, will CMR sign confidentiality agreements uh, when working with a designer? Uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, the, um, uh, we're a company that's founded on some, some unique ideas and bringing some unique ideas into a, to a new world. We, we have a very high respect for intellectual property, um, and we uh, certainly uh, respect your intellectual property. And so um, we sign uh, non-disclosures. With our uh, with our customers, and um, you know, ultimately to be successful in, in a complex design, um, we become part of the design team. You know, uh, where where we do our best work is where uh, one of my magnetics engineers can actually um, participate at some level um, with a design team, and so you know, it's very very important for them to. Uh, to respect that customer's IP, and they do. They do a great job with that, and um, and certainly we would uh, enter into a non-disclosure agreement in order to, uh, you know, to get that uh, down on paper. Okay. Uh, again, keep submitting questions, but uh, as of now, the last one is um, about the, uh, our uh, mag printers, and is there an estimated timeline uh, for when those might be available for sale? Uh, what I would what I would encourage you to do on that is to to contact uh, contact our uh, uh, rep firms. Um, the uh, we we have some partners that are available to to do some uh, uh, to do some prototyping. Um, you know, so we could do something where you can could create your own magnets and um, and prototype those through one of our partners. Um, and certainly, we'd be willing to engage. Uh, you know, in a uh, as a, in a secure way uh, to talk about uh, what you need and, and help you bring it to, to market. Um, some of the magnetic design uh, aspects are, uh, um, are are difficult to to implement, and so um, you know we we like to engage with our customers so that we can help ensure their success and uh, help them get to where they need to be. But uh, uh, certainly, if for the um, for the firms or people that want to, to do it themselves, um, there are ways for them to uh, to create a magnet design and, and get that uh, and get that fabricated. So, um, you know, please uh, please contact us and, and uh, we'll help point you to one of those partners and um, or to, or talk through uh, what we can do to help you. Okay, we uh, continue to get some more uh, questions, which is terrific. Um, Let's see. Uh, does CMR partner with other product design consulting firms providing magnet applications expertise? We have. Uh, that's a great question, and we have worked with some product design firms. Um, 
you know, we we count them as um, you know as customers. Uh, don't know of an official partnership with one, but uh, there's there have been several product design firms that we've worked with, and we and we would be happy to do that. Um, and Jason, why don't you uh, why don't we just talk about uh, um, you know intellectual property in that case? We'd probably have uh, NDAs, uh, three-way uh, NDA in that situation. Yes, absolutely, and and we have done that. Uh, we have an industrial design firm or a PD firm that um, that you're working with, and you want want them to work with us. Um, certainly, we can we can help them with the uh, the magnetic aspects of the design. Um, and sign a, an NDA. There, there are cases where we don't even know who the uh, who the prime is, who the customer is. Um, you know, at during that engagement at the beginning, where they're just uh, they're going through some of the, the possibilities on that. Um, but uh, certainly, we'd be happy to sign a three-way NDA and uh, and help that product design firm with uh, with the, the you know magnetic functions to help make that product uh, unique and uh, and very functional. The next question is, can you address using polymagnets to also conduct power? Limitations, capabilities, device, device, let's say five watts of power. So this is, uh, um, this is a really good question. And um, what I would, I would probably follow this up with a question of, um, why would you want to do that rather than having the magnets hold uh, the um, hold conductors together? You know, so um, you know what I would do from a, an electrical engineering standpoint on that is I would uh, I would size my conductors and and um, design my interface um, and it, and for the connector coming together and then use magnets to hold that together. Uh, we have had people. Uh, I have heard of people uh, conducting electricity through magnets, and it it doesn't seem to uh, it doesn't seem to hurt them. But um, you know that's certainly not their uh, it's not their primary function. And um, um, so I I don't necessarily uh, recommend it. I don't necessarily uh, I don't think I'm giving you a great answer on this one, Stephen. Um, but I would I would probably steer towards um, uh, towards using magnets to connect and use conductors for the electrical aspect. The only thing I'd add, Jason, is that, um, and this is really aimed at everyone, and a lot of people are still uh, listening in, that uh, you know, if you have specific questions uh, uh, and want follow-up on these, please reach out, and we can, uh, we can talk about your case uh, specifically and under NDA uh, if that's something you'd yeah. like to do. So, yes, um, absolutely. Uh, keep the questions coming. Uh, greatly appreciate all the people who have uh, stayed on. Uh, currently, the last one is, does CMR help designers approach patent application efforts? Uh, with respect to um, with respect to product design, that, that has not come up for me um, in, in my time at CMR. Uh, we, we have not had... Um, I don't believe we've had that situation, um, so uh, I, that's something we probably need to to uh, address in more detail. If somebody has a specific question on that, um, but um, you know, it's not something that uh, that I've done uh, so far as far as uh, actually helping someone someone get a uh, a patent. Uh, we have a related question. Um... And it is, if I reference CMR's patent for coded magnets in my patent, how would that affect marketing and production of my design using your coded magnets? Uh, that's a um, that's a great question, uh, and I think that's something that um, uh, that we would probably want to address with our with our legal experts. We we have some uh, experts on the intellectual property. And I'd probably defer that specific question to them. So I think what we should, uh, something like that, we should get, you know, get a question and and look at it. Um, so rather than trying to offer, you know, specific advice on that um, over this forum. Can polymagnets be used to control distant distance limits of moving parts without fully engaging? For example, sliding or rotating. 
they, they can, and, and it's going to be subject to, uh, obviously, the limits of the, the forces. But, um, you know, I'll, I'll give you a, a, a couple of examples of that. One is a, a spring. You know, we have, um, we have a, sp a spring function that uh, could be used to, um, uh, to keep a, a, maintain a certain distance between uh, two components. Now, that, that spring has to be actually constrained, as I mentioned uh, earlier, but, um, uh, but certainly it would help uh, maintain a distance between uh, two components so long as you could maintain that constraint. Um, there's, uh, there's also uh, some features that I'll be talking about a lot more in a later webinar, um, which where you can use some of the uh, alignment features um, to uh, as part of an overall mechanical system uh, to get you know, to get very precise control over distance. Um, magnets themselves, if if I can just talk about the alignment just for a moment, the, the magnets themselves, um, when they're at the equilibrium point, uh, they're they don't offer a specific shear because they're they're in equilibrium, and then as you displace um, as you displace from that, you'll get a force back towards center. So that's a bit of that function, and then if you if you um, you know combine that with some mechanical features, you can get uh, you know really nice control over over distances. What is the accuracy slash tolerance of alignment polymagnets? So, with um, in application, uh, there's two, there's two part answer to that. First off, uh, our our repeatability on on magnetic regions is about uh, uh, plus or minus. 0.25 millimeters. So, uh, so there's there's just a, a little bit of play in where those where those regions are, which um, ends up translating to a, a little bit of play in the alignment. Um, so that's one aspect of it is that there are, there are um, there is a lower limit to the um, to the precision of the magnets. Uh, now that's always we're we're always seeking to improve that. So that's going to get better over time. And the other thing is the the thing that I just mentioned that. Um, uh, as the magnets get uh, get towards the equilibrium point, they can actually um, get to a point where the frictional force, due to the um, the coefficient of friction and the normal force between the magnets, the attraction force between the magnets, is higher than the uh, alignment force. And when you get to that, when you get to that point, the magnet's going to stop. And so you may have a system that has um, you know, has alignment magnets that uh, that tend to self-align, uh, but when those magnets get about a millimeter, when the components are touching and the magnets get about a millimeter out of alignment, um, you know, it, they may stop. Um, so there are some there are some tricks you can do, like I said earlier, with, uh, with the combination of a magnetic system, mechanical system, uh, to, to improve on that situation, but um, uh, you do have to watch out for that where you, where you get the, um, uh, the frictional component actually um, uh, larger than the shear component. Well, it looks like, unless anyone has any uh, additional questions, that we have a, uh, a bunch of people still online, but no questions coming in. Uh, and we've exhausted them all. So what I'm going to do now is uh, say thank you to everyone who is on, uh, uh, online. So we very much appreciate uh, you joining uh, for this webinar. If you'd like to get in touch with us, feel free to either email us uh, on the address on your screen, uh, which is uh, my email address, uh, or visit our contacts page on our website, which is polymagnet.com at this uh, URL listed on your screen. And as I mentioned before, today's webinar will be archived within a few days. Please share the link uh, with anyone you think that might find this webinar valuable. Uh, sign up for our uh, next webinar and share that as well. And on behalf of Correlated Magnetics, I'd like to thank everyone for attending. And uh, please have a good rest of your day. Goodbye.